In this video, I'm going to show you how to go from GoPro footage that looks like this... ...to like this. I've achieved this by knowing some basic filmmaking principles, having the right settings for the right application, using ND filters and an external microphone, as well as doing stabilization and noise reduction in post-production. This is what I'm going to teach you in this video. What are some basic filmmaking principles that we can use in order to create better quality footage? One of the first things we need to think about is choosing an appropriate frame rate and shutter speed for the activity that we're engaged in. So right now, I'm running this at 24 frames per second, 148 shutter speed. This creates a very natural looking motion blur specifically for when I'm just talking to the camera. So if I wave my hand in front of the camera, you can see that there's a lot of motion blur around the hand. Now let's try this at a much higher shutter speed. With this shutter speed, if I wave my hand in front of the camera, you can see a lot more details in the hand. But this also feels pretty unnatural when I'm just talking to the camera. So let's switch back to 148. Another thing we need to think about is minimizing the vibrations in our shot, because nobody wants to watch footage with a lot of vibrations in it. We also need to think about the contrast and the environment which we're shooting in and choosing an appropriate exposure. If I try to shut off the light that I'm using right here, you can see that this doesn't look nearly as professional as this looks like. We also need to consider the fact that audio quality is even more important than image quality. Nobody would watch my YouTube videos if they sounded like this. We also need to think about how we're framing the shot and positioning our subject matter within the shot. Now let's talk about these things in detail. So what is frame rate? Well, frame rate is the amount of frames or images captured per second. You see, video is just a bunch of still images displayed in a row. Just like one of those flipbooks they probably saw as a kid. Now, there are different standards dependent on where you live. In Europe, PAW is a very common standard, which is 25 frames per second. Here in the US, NTSC is the standard, which is usually referred to as 24 and 30 frames per second. However, in reality, it's actually 23.976 and 29.97 frames per second. The reason for this is that at the time when the standards were set, they had technical issues in implementing true 24 and 30 frames per second, and since then the standards have been kept. Today, most of the content that you see here on YouTube and other platforms is 24 frames per second. There have been experiments in cinema with 48 and 60 frames per second, but they never really caught on. Most likely because most people are used to seeing 24 frames per second. For most professional productions, the content is captured in 24 frames per second, edited in 24 frames per second, and then published in 24 frames per second. One great aspect of editing and displaying footage in 24 frames per second is that you can capture footage in 60, 120, and 240 frames per second, slow this footage down, and get really smooth looking slow motion. Shutter speed sets the amount of time that each frame gets exposed. A slower shutter speed is going to give you more light into each frame and more motion blur, whereas a faster shutter speed is going to give you less light into each frame and less motion blur. A common rule of thumb in the motion picture industry is to have twice the shutter speed as your frame rate, because this gives you natural looking motion blur when filming scenes with people just talking. However, this is not always preferable if you're shooting high speed activities. In my opinion, you get so much motion blur that it starts looking unnatural. What I have found is that for activities such as skiing, motorcycle riding, or surfing, the best setting is to have the shutter speed at four times the frame rate. This way you get natural looking motion blur, but just not too much. However, at 24 frames per second, this does not always work well with the stabilization software in the camera, nor if we try to stabilize it in post-production, where we get this yellow effect at times in the video. What I have found is that 60 frames per second and a 240 shutter speed creates the desired motion blur while providing the software with enough frames to work with for high speed activities. This is a compromise of course, as displaying 60 frames per second at 24 blends some frames. 
To get smooth and sharp slow motion footage, I have found that a shutter speed at 4 times the frame rate produces the most natural looking motion blur for high speed activities. If we would have a shutter speed of only 2 times the frame rate, we get way too much motion blur when replayed at 24 frames per second. So if you're recording at 60 frames per second and plan on slowing this down by 40% in a 24 frame per second timeline, you want a 240 shutter speed. As you have hopefully understood by now, this depends on what you're shooting specifically. What is important here is that we understand how shutter speed relates to frame rate and how this is affected by our replay speed. The stabilization software available with the camera and in post-production is generally really good at handling low and medium frequency vibrations. Let's try that out. Now what the current stabilization software really can't handle is high frequency vibrations. Let's try that out. So in order to mitigate this, we have to consider where we're mounting the camera and what type of a mount we're using. A simple way to make sure that the camera never sees those high frequency vibrations is to mount it somewhere on your body. I really like to use the chest mount. Another safe bet is to mount it on top of a helmet. Wherever you mount the camera, you should definitely grab a hold of it and just make sure that it's not going to be flopping back and forth. When mounting directly on top of something like a motorcycle, it's also important that we consider what type of a mount that we're using. I found that these really short mounts with a lock-in feature is really good at mitigating medium frequency vibrations. I have also found that the suction cup mount can to some degree mitigate high frequency vibrations. This also depends on your specific application. Some motorcycles vibrate more than others and for example mounting directly to the frame of a two-stroke go-kart is probably not going to be a great idea. Simply try out different mounting positions before running the camera for any length of time. For example, I tried out mounting a Hero 9 directly onto the front fender of my Hus Kvarna 701, and the stabilization does work pretty well. What about gimbals? Well, before the Hero 7, I experimented with a bunch of different gimbals for motorcycle footage, both single-axis ones and multiple-axis ones. And really, the single-axis ones were the only ones that kinda made some sense. But sometimes they got stuck at different angles, and then you got useless footage. These days, I don't use gimbals whatsoever. In any environment that you're shooting in, there's going to be a contrast between the highlights and the shadows. On a bright sunny day, the difference in light intensities between the highlights and shadows is going to be much greater than, say, on an overcast day. How much detail a camera can capture in the highlights and shadows is usually referred to as dynamic range. GoPros have a fairly good dynamic range given their very small sensor but still require adjustments and exposure if you say drive on a road surrounded by fields into an area with trees on each side of the road. The adjustment and exposure has to be made so that we do not crush the shadows or get clipping highlights. One important rule of thumb regarding this is that crushed shadows can be saved in post-production, while clipping highlights cannot be saved at all. Therefore, it is often best to underexpose slightly rather than overexpose. With the GoPro, exposure can be adjusted with shutter speed, ISO, and filters that we put over the lens. Now, because shutter speed also controls the amount of motion blur, we want to avoid adjusting shutter speed for exposure. Instead, we want to adjust the ISO. When we're adjusting the ISO value on a digital camera, we're adjusting the signal gain of the sensor. A higher ISO value means that we're letting in more light. When we raise the ISO value, we also get more noise in the image. Now GoPros are notorious for producing a lot of noise because of their very small sensor size. So I never run over an ISO of 400. In order to let the camera adjust exposure on the fly, we can set a minimum and maximum range for ISO. I always set this to 100 to 400. With the shutter speed set and ISO range defined, for a bright sunny day, we have to use a neutral density filter to not overexpose. ND filters work pretty much like a pair of sunglasses, limiting the amount of light that reaches the sensor. There are a bunch of different ND filters out there. 
I have a set of newer filters for my Hero 6 and 7 cameras, and my personal favorites are the ones from Freewell for the Hero 9, which instead of going on top of the lens cover, replaces the lens cover. A much more robust solution and less layers between the lens and whatever I'm filming means better quality footage. Time to talk audio. In order to get good audio, we want to avoid distortion and minimize noise. Distortion happens when we, for instance, scream into the microphone and the microphone can't handle the volume. Uh... Noise is an external signal added to the original signal. So for instance, when wind blows straight into the microphone, we're getting wind noise and it can also overload the microphone, creating distortion. The microphones on the latest generation GoPros are comparatively good at cutting out wind noise, given their very small size. But if you mount any of the Hero cameras on top of a motorcycle helmet and drive around, I think the audio is pretty much useless. The audio from the Max, however, is actually good enough that you could use it. To get good audio, we want to have the microphone at an ample distance from the main sound source. So if I hold the microphone over here, it's not going to sound as good as it sounds over here. I found that the best solution to get great audio on my motorcycle is to attach a lavalier microphone with a wind jammer on the back of my motorcycle jacket. I then have this plugged in to a Rio de Go wireless system that is plugged in to the media mod. This is also a very simple way of avoiding vibrations. In my experience, the GoPros seem to do a decent job of keeping the audio levels in check with this solution. Another way to do this is to use an external recorder like the Zoom H1. That way you have full control over the audio levels, and another benefit is that these don't generate a lot of noise. You see, GoPros tend to be quite noisy if you're just talking to the camera in an otherwise quiet environment. Using ND filters and an external microphone, as well as doing stabilization and noise reduction in post-production. Using ND filters and an external microphone, as well as doing stabilization and noise reduction in post-production. So in order to get good audio quality, we need to use wind jammers in high wind situations, have the microphone at an ample distance from the main sound source, and we need to mount the microphone in a place with little to no vibrations. Framing involves composing the visual content that's within the camera's field of view. Some basic things we need to think about when it comes to framing is aspect ratio, the GoPro's field of view options, the camera's position, layering, center framing, and the rule of thirds. Aspect ratio is the proportional relationship between the height and width of the image. GoPro Heroes and the Max in Hero Mode can record in 16 to 9 and 4 to 3 aspect ratios. 16 to 9 is commonly used in television and replaced 4 to 3 as the most common format in around 2009. The purpose of having 4 to 3 aspect ratios available on the GoPro is not necessarily to publish the content in that format. The 4 to 3 format captures the biggest field of view possible. So if we capture footage in 4 to 3, we have more flexibility to reframe the shot in post. This can be very useful. Say we for instance shot in 16 to 9 with the camera on top of our helmet, pointing slightly too far down. In this case, we get footage that is pretty much useless. If we capture this in 4 to 3, we have more space to reframe and post to get what we want. Given the big range of aspect ratios that our footage could be published in, I think maximum flexibility in post is key when shooting with the GoPro. We want to capture as much of the scene as possible. This is also why 360 cameras like the Max have become so popular, since they allow maximum flexibility in post. There is a downside with having a huge field of view though and that is distortion. At maximum fields of view, we get what is usually referred to as barrel distortion or a fisheye effect, where straight lines are distorted. 
For a lot of point-of-view footage of action sports, the distortion is less noticeable. But if we're filming ourselves talking to the camera, this distortion can be very unpleasant. To solve this, we can use a linear field of view, which removes that distortion. For any type of point-of-view footage of action sports, I would recommend using as big field of view as possible. This allows us to see all the action and makes for more immersive footage. So either super view if we're shooting in 16 to 9, or wide if we're shooting in 4 to 3. It is also possible to remove some of the distortion in post, which I will show you how to do. Now let's talk camera position. You see, the camera's position in relation to the subject has a big impact on the field of the shot. If the camera's on the same eye level as the person talking, this has a neutral effect on the audience. If the camera is below the person talking, it feels like I am bigger than you. And if the camera is above the person talking, it feels like you are bigger than me. When we're just talking to the camera, it is best to either have it at eye level or just slightly below eye level. There's a similar effect when filming ourselves doing action sports. Having the camera facing from below makes us look more heroic and strong. Another interesting perspective is over the shoulder shots, where we can see ourselves and the action in front of us. This can be achieved by having a selfie stick in a backpack or using mounts like these. But be really careful if you're using mounts like these because they can be really dangerous in a high-speed crash. It is also possible to get these types of shots with the camera mounted on something behind us, like the rear fender on a motorcycle. Then of course there is the most popular shot with GoPros, point of view footage. In my experience with point of view footage, we want to balance seeing parts of the arms and hands with how much we can see in front of us. I have found that point of view shots where the focus is on the scenic environment, it is best to have the camera on top of the helmet. Whereas a chin or chest mount, is best if we want to focus more on the action happening in the shot. Having a variety of shots from different angles really is key if we want to create something interesting. Speaking of variety, in some shots we may want to mount the camera at an angle for effect. Other times we may want to have a level horizon. We can get horizon leveling with the Hero 9 in linear mode up to 45 degrees, and with the add-on lens you can get this in 360 degrees. 360 degree horizon leveling is also possible with the Max. It can create a really cool effect if we move in relation to the camera. For a lot of point of view footage, we may not want to have a level horizon because we lose some natural movement of the camera, which adds to the action. In order to create interesting shots, we want to use layering to show the three-dimensional environment. Layering can be thought of as foreground, middle ground, and background. The foreground is the closest to the audience's eye. The middle ground is between the foreground and background, and the background is space far away. Seeing parts of arms and hands in point of view shots is an excellent example of layering. When it comes to the position of different elements within the frame, I have found two techniques really useful. The first technique is center framing, where we have the focal point of what we are filming in the center of the frame. I find this technique very simple to implement and it's very easy for the audience to understand where to look. Another useful technique is the rule of thirds. Here, we think of the image as divided in nine equal parts by two equally spaced horizontal lines and two equally spaced vertical lines. The rule of thirds states that important elements should be placed along these lines and at their intersections. You can activate the grid function on your GoPro to see the lines you use to apply this technique. Another thing to consider is how far away the subject's head is from the top of the frame. We don't want too much space here, as it makes the person look really small. Now let's have a look at the settings available in the camera and set up a couple of different profiles based on the types of footage that we're going to capture. So first up, resolution. So a digital image is made up of a grid of individual pixels representing a color. If we zoom in really far in our footage, we can see these individual pixels. When we pick a resolution, we are picking the amount of horizontal and vertical pixels that the footage will be represented by. So for example, in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, 4K with the GoPro is 3840 times 2160. It's easy to assume that a higher resolution automatically means we get a much higher image quality. But the difference is not as noticeable as we might expect. The difference between 5K and 4K is barely noticeable. 4K to 2.7K is not that noticeable either. 
When going from 2.7K to 1080, we can now see a clear difference. When we pick our resolution, we want to consider the frame rates and fields of view available. In my experience, I would rather compromise resolution than any of those factors. We discussed frame rates earlier. I mostly shoot in 24 and 60 frames per second. For activities where the camera moves around and shakes a lot, I would recommend shooting at 60 frames per second. If not, 24 frames per second is my go-to, as that is also what I publish all my videos in. We have also discussed fields of view, or what GoPro calls lens. For any type of footage where we're just talking to the camera, I would recommend using the linear setting, and when shooting any type of high-speed activities, I recommend using the largest field of view possible, which is either super view in 16x9 or wide in 4x3. For stabilization, if I use the in-camera stabilization, I always have this in the on setting, never high or boost. This is because the higher settings tend to crop the image too much. It's possible to schedule when the camera starts recording to set a time limit of how long it should record. I never use these functions myself, but I can see some people finding it useful. We can set a time limit for how long the camera will record, which could be useful if we want to make sure we don't run out of memory. It is also possible to set the camera to record up to 30 seconds before the record button was pressed. I don't use this function since I mostly capture footage of me riding motorcycles, so I wouldn't be able to press record when something interesting happened. I always start recording way ahead of time. We can set a timer delay if we want the camera to start recording a couple of seconds after we press record, which I never use. It's possible to zoom, but it's purely a digital zoom, worsening the quality of the footage. I always have this set to 1x. Bitrate is the amount of detail that is stored per unit of time. A higher bitrate means the footage will contain more details, but we also get larger file sizes. When looking at footage straight out of the camera without uploading it anywhere, the difference between standard and high bit rates are barely noticeable. However, what I have noticed is that when uploading to YouTube, I get significantly less compression artifacts if I use the high setting. Therefore, I always use the high setting. We talked about shutter speeds earlier. EV comp means exposure value compensation. This affects the camera's auto-calculated exposure, which is very important if we allow it to set the exposure. When the GoPro is left to figure out the exposure, it always overexposes. Therefore, I always have the set to negative 0.5. White balance is about setting the color temperature in such a way that primarily skin tones look natural. In different light conditions, such as a bright sunny day at noon or at sundown, we have to adjust the color balance so that the image is not too warm or too cold. I always have this set to auto and on rare occasions make adjustments in post. We talked about ISO earlier. I always have this set to 100 min and 400 max. The sharpness setting defines how much contrast we add between the edges. When the camera is sharpening the footage, it is artificially adding lines to make the image look like it's more in focus. So in other words, an image with a lot of sharpening does not contain more details. Rather, there's just more contrast between the edges. But then, don't we really want sharp footage? I think we want footage that is in focus with a lot of sharpness in the right areas. For example, a lot of high-speed footage looks really bad with the sharpness set to high. It ends up looking really jarring. There's too many contrasty black lines flying by. For this type of footage, I always have sharpening set to low. I then add sharpening where I want the audience to look. That way we get beautiful soft motion blur on the sides and a sharp center. Now, if I don't want to post-process the footage too much, I always set this to medium. The color profile setting allows us to choose from the GoPro color or flat, which captures more details in shadows and highlights, allowing us to color grade the footage more extensively in post. The color profile affects the entire mood of the shot. If we really want our footage to stand out, then we need to color grade it. I always shoot in flat since I always color grade my footage. Raw audio allows us to record an audio track with no processing. I like to have this on and at low, as I always use an equalizer and apply noise reduction as well as compression in post-production. Now let's set up some profiles based on the activities that we're going to capture. First, here are three profiles with no extra accessories and minimal post-production. It's gotta be against the law to look this damn good. Cause baby, I feel real good and I wish I would. It's gotta be against the law to look this damn good. 
Now, here are three profiles where we have access to ND filters, an external microphone, and we're going to do a lot of post-production. If none of these profiles match exactly what you're planning on doing with the camera, then you can use them as inspiration. Also, with the basic filmmaking principles that you now should know, you know how to set up different profiles for different activities. Now we get to the part which I personally enjoy the most, post-production. Let's get to it. I use Final Cut Pro for my editing. What I will show you here is still going to be relevant for any editing software. So this is a clip from my trip that I did to Norway in 2019. I filmed this with a Hero 7 with a flat color profile. Let's first have a look at some basic adjustments that we do to a clip that we want to use in our production. First, let's remove the lens distortion. There's a free plugin for Final Cut Pro called Alex4D Wide Angle Fix. Even though it comes with preset levels, I like to use the custom function and drag it until it looks good. What we want is to remove the really noticeable barrel distortion. For this type of a scenic shot, I think we want a level horizon. Go to View, click Show Horizon. Now use this as a reference to get a level horizon. I am editing this in a 2 to 1 aspect ratio, so we need to crop the image to fit. Go to Spatial Conform, click Fill. This is a scenic shot where I think we want to see a lot of the cool environment and just a little bit of the motorcycle. Let's move the image around to that. Now let's adjust the white balance. To do this, I drag a color board on top of the clip. Now go into color, set master to 30 degrees. To get a warmer image, we pull the master up and to get a colder image, we pull it down. To my eye, the white balance is almost spot on. I adjusted it by 1% down. Now let's adjust the contrast. To do this, let's first activate the waveform to support us in adjusting the contrast. Go to View, Show and Viewer, Video Scopes. Here we can see if we have any crushed shadows or clipping highlights. As we can see, we don't have any crushed shadows or clipping highlights, because there are no collected lines above 100 or below 0. Now let's go back to the color board. Click the Exposure tab. Here we can adjust the shadows, mid-tones and highlights by dragging the points up and down. Let's first solidify our understanding of clipping highlights and crushed shadows. Drag the highlights point up. You see how we get a line drawn above 100. Now look over at the image. This is what clipping highlights look like. Now grab the shadow point and pull it down. You see how we're drawing a line at the bottom below zero. Okay, so our goal here is to create an image with a nice contrast between highlights and shadows. Let's pull the points back to zero. Now let's raise the shadows slightly so that no part of the waveform is below zero. Now let's do the same with the highlights. Pull them down so nothing is above 100. Okay, we now have a base adjustment down, but in my opinion the image is not popping like it should. Let's add a color curve. We will now adjust the luma curve, which represents the brightness of the image. The lower part is the shadows and upper part is the highlights. By adjusting the curve, we are changing the brightness in a more specific part of the spectrum. This way we can keep the shadows dark while also lifting the midtones if we want to. Now let's sharpen parts of the image. Remember how I mentioned earlier that we don't want to sharpen the entire shot, just details that we want to highlight. Drag sharpen onto the clip. Click add shape mask. Let's highlight the area over here. We simply adjust the size of the mask and the feather. When we locally sharpen footage in this way, we are showing the audience where they should look. It also allows us to sharpen these details quite a lot without getting that over sharpened look. Now let's add some color to this. First, add a new color board that we will use to do some detail adjustments if needed. Go to saturation and pull the master up. Now we're going to add a LUT to get a new color scheme for our shot. LUTs are used to map one color space to another. There are a bunch of different LUT packages available for GoPros. One that I use is IWTBAP, which has a big pack of LUTs designed for the GoPro. We can then browse around and find one that we think fits the scene. 
Sometimes the LUTs we find are not exactly what we want. Then we can adjust the mix to tone them down, and also use the color board above to make detailed adjustments. I think this one is a bit too cold. Let's add some orange back into the shot. And so, here's our shot before and after. Now, let's look at a slow motion shot. We do the same base adjustments to the image as before. For this shot, let's first sharpen everything just a little bit. We will then add a local sharpen around the rear wheel. So the effect I'm looking for here is to make the rear wheel stand out. I add a local sharpening with a mask just as in the last clip. Only this time it needs to follow the rear wheel. We cannot see the rear wheel all the time, so let's add a keyframe and pull sharpening down to zero when we can start to see it. Let's align the mask right there, and add a keyframe for the mask as well. Now we move to one frame before the wheel hits the box that the camera is standing on. Move the mask to this position. Also add a key point for the sharpening level. Looks like this. Let's look at it without the sharpening. See the difference? Now let's add a speed ramp to 40%. We use range selection and select where we want the slow motion. Go to modify, read time, click custom speed. Select 40%. It looks like this. This clip is a bit noisy, especially because we sharpened the whole thing. I use a plugin called Neat Video to reduce noise. It is very simple to use. You select an area that is uniform, where there's not any major difference in light intensity. Then you simply build a profile and apply. There are a bunch of fine tuning you can do, but that's the gist of it. Remember I mentioned that the audio can be a bit noisy when we're just talking to the camera. We can hear this tss sound in the background. All cameras generate noise like this, but the GoPro is really quite noisy. Let's fix that. I like to use a plugin called NS1 Noise Suppressor from Wave Central. I always set it to between 100 and 200. Works like a charm. Now let's have a look at the stabilization software Real Steady Go. It uses the GoPro's gyro data to stabilize the footage. In my opinion, it creates even better stabilization than Hypersmooth. It also retains more field of view. It works with all GoPros from the Hero 5 and up, but you have to have recorded the footage with stabilization disabled. It works only with the super view and the wide fields of view, and it seems to do the best job if you have recorded at 60 frames per second. So all you do is select the clip you have recorded. It analyzes the data and boom, it's stabilized. You can adjust the smoothness and lock the horizon if you want. If the clip is not perfectly stable at points, you add a sync point where that happens. You then go in and adjust the stabilization at that specific sync point. I have never had to use sync points. I believe this is mostly useful for really fast drones. We then render the video and can add it to our timeline to do all of our adjustments. So in conclusion, in order to get epic GoPro footage, we need to know some basic filmmaking principles, have the right settings for the right applications, use ND filters and external microphones, as well as know some basic post-production. Remember to subscribe to my channel, there is always something new to learn. It's gotta be against the law to look this damn good. Cause baby I feel real good and I wish I would. It's gotta be against the law to look this damn good. Everybody watch out. Watch out now, I'm ready for a good time And I came to groove, the whole band's here and we came to move Got a fresh haircut and two new shoes, we're here all night like we got nothing